to my, my quick round here. Hello, everybody. This Welcome to the Master Gardeners program series on summer vegetable gardening. Uh, Scott uh, Shupi is going to be our speaker today, and we're very excited to have him share the wealth of knowledge he has. If you have any questions, like I mentioned before, please refer them to the Q&A section so that we can share our answers with everyone. And when the presentation is done and it is posted for everyone to see and use, they will get to see all of those questions and answers as well. Uh, with that, Scott, please take it away. Welcome. Okay, thank you very much, Christy. Hi, everybody. Um, summer vegetable gardening. Well, I kind of look at it in two, two different ways when it comes to summer. Um, there's a lot of things you can do besides grow vegetables or in addition to growing vegetables. And that's, how I, that's pretty much how I spend my summers. So for today's agenda is obviously North Florida, as most of, most of us know, um, we live in a subtropical climate. So it's very different growing conditions here as opposed to the more temperate regions uh, up north. And that's really kind of the genesis of this particular um, slideshow and presentation is there is, uh, we have found that there's a lot of people that are transports, uh, me included, even though I've, I've been here for 20 years now, um, it's very different uh, gardening down here in the summertime. So I give you uh, some ideas for your garden, uh, some crops for your gardens, and some other things that you can do to care for your garden uh, during the course of the growing season in summer. So a lot of us are, are very used to, especially for transplants, growing vegetables throughout the summertime. Uh, down here, unfortunately, most of those vegetables that you think of don't really grow at all. If you're lucky, you'll get a little bit out of it, especially if you're used to uh, very temperate crops. Okay. There are basically two seasons here in Florida. Uh, the spring season, which we're kind of getting at the end of right now, um, the spring season, I always kind of think of ends, ends like in the first, first week of June is kind of, that's it. Um, and then the fall season really starts in September, as far as plants are concerned and runs through even as I say December in, in the slide here, but yeah, you can get into January and February, but um, then it just depends on the crops you're growing in the winter time. So for the summertime, as I mentioned though, we live in a very subtropical climate here um, where temperatures are above 50 degrees most of the time. And if it's, and, and then in the summertime, of course it rains, uh, you can set your clock basically by the thunderstorms that occur every four, four o'clock in the afternoon, roughly, uh, during the summertime. So there are a lot of challenges that come with growing in that type of environment. As I've kind of outlined here, pests, uh, uh, everything here, this is the way I look at it. Everything grows like crazy in North Florida in the summertime, which includes your weeds, disease, vegetables, um, and then other things like uh, rodents, squirrels, they, they, because there's kind of a dearth in, in the summertime for food for them, well, uh, they, they like to raid. <laughs> That's the way I like to put it. Um, so you have to be very vigilant and you have to select your vegetables right and or you can do other things. Um, it gives you a chance to try things like soil solarization, which I'm going to go to in a little bit, plant cover crops, which is really, that is the focus of what I do in my gardens in the summertime. It also gives us a, a really good chance to, to tidy up, repair, expand, all those things. Obviously, that work needs to be done in the early morning before it gets to be 95 degrees. Up. So let's talk about soil, soil solarization. Um, what is it? Why should you do it, etc.? Well, what it is, is uh, the biggest reason to do it is you're kind of cleansing the top eh, four inches or so of your soil. Um, if you try to grow, and it doesn't have to be in a raised bed, like I have pictured here, one of my raised beds when I, I, I did this uh, three years ago, I wanted to see the effects of it, what it did, um, etc. Um, it's hard to talk about something if you haven't experienced it. So um, the biggest reason, if you've ever tried to grow, especially tomatoes here in North Florida in native soil, 
you have more than likely run into the dreaded nematodes that we find here in our soil, very prevalent. Well, soil solarization will uh, eliminate a part or a portion of those nematodes because they really cannot, they can't stand temperatures over 120 degrees. Well, if you solarize your soil, you have to use clear plastic. You need to weight it down, okay? And the wavelength of light that we get, it's short wavelength uh, radiation, as I mentioned in the screen, uh, penetrate will penetrate up to four, maybe five inches of soil. Um, and it will uh, it drastically reduce the nematode population you have in your soil. Now, if you have raised beds that, for example, what's pictured here is a 16 inch uh, sidewall. So I basically have about 12 inches of soil, 13 inches of soil in there. And it, the, there is no native soil that, have, that is built into that. So my chances of seeing nematodes is gonna take several years before I'm gonna see them. A nematode traveling at its maximum speed in the course of a year can move about two inches. Okay, so you, you gotta realize that doesn't seem like it's very much, but if, if you have your beds and you're going for five, six, seven years, and all of a sudden those nematodes will be to the surface or close to the surface and they'll be feasting on the roots. So this is one of the best practices for driving them lower in the soil column and or eliminating a big portion of them. Okay, there's a few things to do if you're gonna solarize your soil. Um, you gotta have unshaded areas. You want full sun in those areas. Um, you can till your soil. I'm not a till guy, but you can till your soil before putting your plastic on top. Um, and again, clear plastic is really very, very important. Okay, all right, cover crops. This is kind of my main crop. My main crop for uh, the summertime is creating green manure. You get a lot of benefits by doing this. That's how I build soil. I'm constantly building new soil in my beds. Um, you're gonna increase your nitrogen um, by, by planting plants that, that pull nitrogen out of the atmosphere. They're nitrogen fixers and they disperse it through their uh, exudates in their uh, roots. It also is a great way to control weeds, which go crazy here in the summer. Uh, you're going to get have you're going to really give your soil a chance to stay in place. You're going to avoid soil erosion with the rains that we come. It will reduce your nematodes. Um, and it keeps what is most important to me personally is it keeps your soil food web active. I like to keep mine active all 12 months out of the year. So what is the most important thing when it comes to this is there's a few caveats to doing this. You, I chop and drop mine um, in place. What is really important is you cannot allow your cover crops to, to go to seed. If they go to seed, well, they're just gonna perpetuate themselves and that's gonna give you some fits. And I have had a lot of people try to emulate how I garden and they, they get caught up in especially some clovers and, and certain things will just constantly regenerate themselves. Millet is another one. Um, another thing you can do though, if you don't wanna, if you wanna have those crops, you can remove them when you chop them prior to them going to seed and compost all that. It's really great green manure. It's a longer process of um, mineral cycling. You're recycling minerals. Uh, you know, in and out of your soil by doing that. But I, you know, rather than just dropping it on top, putting some compost, and that's what I do. I drop my cover crop on top. I'll put compost on top of that and let nature run its course across July and August and a little bit into September. And by, by doing that, the summer heat is, is just, the, the Florida sun does a great job in rapidly decomposing just about everything. So some cover crops to consider, and uh, you see on the bottom here of the screen, um, UF IFAS Alachua County fact sheet number 2221. Uh, Dr. Clem and I co-authored that sheet. It is available. I don't know if it's available online in a PDF. 
Uh, that would be a question that Taylor could answer. I did not check um, prior to coming on here, um, but it is available through the extension office uh, and it really outlines cover crops for the summertime, cover crops for the winter time, um, things that are ideal to grow when if you're doing cover crops at either of those seasons. But as you can see, millet, cow peas, lab lab, which is another bean, um, cow peas, the lab lab, uh, the velvet bean down the, those are all nitrogen fixers. So they're gonna build nitrogen in your soil. Now, the reason that I do it in the summer and I use, um, I use the nitrogen fixers is simply because the crops that come in the fall, coal crops, um, green leafy crops, are nitrogen hungry plants. So I wanna get more nitrogen into my soil by doing that. Now, one thing that I will say, I, I have a little asterisk by the sun hemp um, there. I'll mention this with sun hemp. If you're gonna grow sun hemp, which is what is pictured on the screen here, um, it is a very, fibrous plant. It has a very high carbon to nitrogen ratio, so it does not decompose fast. And you have got to chop that down early. Um, you do not, you know, I have it pictured here in a commercial application where it has gone to flower. Um, you can't let this go to flower because it will take a year for it to decompose in your garden. It's just very fibrous. The other thing that I want to mention also, if you're going to do cover crops, is don't just pick one crop. Like don't just plant millet or just don't plant um, buckwheat or sesame or what, okay, you want to mix and match, okay? So when I do cover crops, I'll take seeds of all of these things that are listed. <clears throat> Excuse me. By doing that, what I'm trying to do is emulate nature. If you think about it, if you drive past a field that mother, mother nature is taking care of, she doesn't have just one plant in her field. She's probably got 30 or 40 different plants. that are all growing at the same time. <coughs> so keep that in mind. Okay, things to consider. Let's get into the, the meat of this, the vegetables, which is what most of you have tuned in for or are gonna watch this for. Things you have to watch about or watch for in, in, in summer vegetable gardening is the plan that you have to plan for it. You have to take several things into consideration. Well, how many days to maturity of your fruit? That's a big thing. Are you overlapping with your fall season? So in other words, um, if, if it takes 150 days for a, a crop to mature, and there's one in particular I'm thinking of that is gonna be in one of the slides here. Well, you need to, to maybe start those early. So there's some cover, sorry, some summer crops, eggplant, for example. I've already got my eggplant started. I started my eggplants in April because I want them to come to maturity by the 4th of July so that I can enjoy eating eggplant, I eat a lot of eggplant. Um, I can enjoy that July, August, September, maybe even deep into September, I'll still be pulling those out of, out, of the, out of the garden. So, and a question you have to ask yourself, are you starting from, when it comes to planting, are you gonna start this from seed or are you gonna go to one of those stores and buy transplants? And that's also has to be a consideration. So those are things that you gotta think about when you're doing this. And if you're doing this while growing cover crops, which is one of the things I do, you got to consider space. Now I just plant plants, I plant my cover crops into the stuff that's already there. So they start coming up as I'm harvesting this, these vegetables. All right. One thing I always say when it comes to summer, summer crops, summer vegetables, and I put this on here, be careful with your fertilization. And I said, don't be a moron gardener. And what I mean by moron is not an idiot, but don't be pouring more fertilizer on. Um, the reason that I say that is things grow exceedingly well here, um, especially plants that have the, the temperament, that's a good word for it, to grow in this environment in the summertime. So, one of the things that's very important though that I always tell people if you're gonna grow vegetables in the summer is you have got to mulch. 
Um, it's going to help retain soil in your moisture. It will help build your soil over the course of time. But it is water retention is very important. If you don't have something laying on the top surface of your soil, evaporation is very rapid here in the summertime. And then plant spacing. If anybody out there is a square foot gardener, um, you have to dramatically increase the space between plants in the summertime. And the reason for that is when you tightly pack plants in, and this comes from experience, um, disease spreads very rapidly here, especially fungus um, problems. So if you have plants that are really packed tight together, a fungus or a disease can very rapidly spread in your garden and kind of takes, takes it, you might as well just pull, pull the darn stuff out. Um, you've kind of wasted that season. So I, you got to spread your plants out. And I don't know if you can see in my picture here, but these are bok choy plants. And normally if you're a square foot gardener, uh, bok choy, you can grow one within a square foot. I expand that out to 18 inches. So I expand by 50% of the space. So I'm using 50% more space per plant. So I get real good airflow underneath my plants. Now, soil. Everybody that most of the master gardeners that know me, and if you're just coming to know me right now in this presentation, soil is my hot button. Um, the plants that grow out of my soil are just kind of the benefit that I get for having great soil. Um, I, I always like to drop a little little thing about soil testing. It's a very good idea. Uh, you can get a soil test kit from the extension office and have that run through the lab. It's very cost effective here. Uh, the UF Soil Lab is uh, one of the best in the world, and you can argue with me if that what you want, but you'll lose the argument. Um, it's a good idea to get your soil tested at least once every couple of years if you have a, uh, a mineral, uh, a lack of certain minerals, you'll find out in that process. Um, it's also summertime is a very good time to add soil amendments to into your soil as fertilizers. <laughs> Some of the things I'm thinking of is a, a composted organic matter, rotted manures, but then other things um, like kelp is a really good soil amendment. And it just helps, uh, it helps the soil food web build more organic matter, which means that it can caddy at an exchange capacity basically means it can hold more minerals in the soil, which is what your plants need to grow. It's also a very good time to add uh, things that increase your water holding capacity, such as perlite, vermiculite, and coco core. And you're going to, you can work those into your soil um, really kind of prior to planting your cover crops. Okay, fertilizing your garden. Before, yeah, everybody's like, well, when are we going to get to the plants that I'm going to grow? Okay, well, to prep your garden, like I, I mentioned earlier, this is, goes into the part of the planning. You need to plan for your summer vegetables because everything grows so rapidly here. The plants that are successful at growing in North Florida in the summertime are mineral hogs, okay? So it's very, very wise to, uh, you can broadcast meaning cover the entire garden surface with a, you know, you got to read your packaging for whatever fertilizer you choose and, and lay down the appropriate amount. Okay. And then you can top and side dress specific plants. And I'm going to go into some examples here in the, in the coming slides. With regards to water, hopefully, hopefully mother nature helps us with the water, but you generally, because of the heat here, want to get one to two inches of water a week. You like to water in the in the early morning if you can get out really early. Um, you want to give your your pollinators a chance to work in the morning. Um, but what I say is before the sun gets really high in the sky. I think if you're watering after 10 a.m., you're way too late. I like to water in that that seven to nine o'clock in the morning area. That still you've, your pollinators have had an hour and a half or an hour to get to get to your plants by then. <clears throat> and it'll help, it'll help propagate your garden much better. Now, when you're doing broadcast watering, as I have uh, shown here on the left-hand side of the screen, one of the things you want to, that 
I'm not a big fan of doing that. I rather do drip irrigation or even hand irrigation right on the surface of the soil because fungus spreads so rapidly um, it, that and the sun is very, very, very harsh on plants. If water is sitting on the leaves, you can easily burn your leaves because of the heat of the sun and the refractal uh, properties of water. Okay, seeds or transplants. Um, if you're starting seeds, proper planting is really important. Uh, as I mentioned just earlier, my eggplants, my eggplants, I planted my eggplant seeds put into soil uh, actually last week of March this year is when I put them in because I want them to be effective. So there's certain things that you can plant right now. If you're going to start from seed right now, you'll still get a crop. But one of the things in North Florida is seasons kind of cross over here in North Florida. So um, I always say you really have to plant, plan and you have to know your time to, to maturity of the crop here in North Florida. So I, you know, lots of people ask me, oh, I'm new to North Florida. You know, I love to grow tomatoes. Uh, I'm used to planting them in April. I'm like, no, 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 you got to start them in like the last week of January. And if it's a bad day or you're going to get, we're going to get frost, which we get all the time in January and February, you got to bring those plants in overnight or you need a little greenhouse or something to protect those plants. So a lot of people do choose just to go out, buy the plants that they want and tra transplant them into their garden space or their containers, whatever it is. Obviously, there's some caveats to that as I outlined here on the screen. Okay, so the heart and soul of this, what veggies are gonna grow really well here in North Florida? Cherry tomatoes. I love tomatoes. That's my favorite crop to grow, period. Um, I grow three different types of tomatoes. Uh, and in the summertime, the cherry tomatoes, once my crops that I'm bringing in right now actually kind of run out, um, cherry tomatoes fill the gap. And I prefer what I have shown here, sun golds. They do marvelously here. Um, they are very sweet. And I, and, and I like tomatoes so much because I like Italian food. It's my favorite type of food. And uh, sun gold cherry tomatoes make a wonderful caprese salad. Uh, it's a little not traditional caprese salad. I cut them in half and toss everything together and there, there's my, that's my salad. A few things to know about cherry tomatoes. Um, one of the things I didn't list on here is they really need a trellis. You need to give them something to grow up on. And you can, I've had sun gold tomatoes get to be 10, 12 feet tall and loaded with tomatoes. Um, Fertilizer is very important when it comes to this though, and water is. Um, I put on there, fertilize every three weeks and you wanna have something that is specific for tomatoes. Tomatoes are magnesium and calcium heavy uh, feeders on those minerals and, and to get a good crop, you're, you're gonna wanna have that well into your soil. And I give some examples of the things that you can grow that come when it comes to cherry tomatoes. I can't say it again, say it, you know, fully. Sun golds, those seeds are available all over the place. You can find them at the big box stores. Um, you can find them at, at, you know, seed stores and you can find them online readily. Few other uh, heat resist, resistant tomatoes. Uh, the Florida 91 was uh, developed right here at the University of Florida. Um, I have, I do not grow them per, uh, me personally, I have in the past. Um, I, I, you know, have found some success with them. Um, it's interesting. They're, they're very interesting plants because they need to have, it needs to be really hot for you to get a fruit set. So they do really well. They still really, like if you plant them in at the end of May or the early June, they don't really get going until we get to past the 4th of July. Um, once we get past there, then you'll start getting some of those tomatoes. And they are a little bit different from uh, your average everyday tomatoes. Okay. And one of the things I always, I found you have to, you have to pick them before they're truly ripe because they're going to crack on you because they're so, we get so much rain here. Okay. Ooh, one of my favorite things, peppers and chilies. Peppers and chilies do really well here. 
um, you planning on peppers and chilies again, you got to start your seeds. If you're starting seeds, if you want to do seeds in mid April, um, we're like right at the very end of seed starts. Um, I would even say at this point on the calendar, you want to consider going out and getting uh, transplants if you're going to do peppers. Okay. They love full sun. They are absolute sunbathers. Fertilizer is very important. I always side dress my peppers, always. Be, and the reason for that is because, as I've noted here on the screen, they are very hungry for calcium and magnesium. They really need calcium and magnesium. Those plants need it to mature the peppers. Okay. Now, a couple of things about maturing peppers. Um, Two things to note, I, I outlined a few of the peppers that you're gonna wanna consider. They grow very well here. Uh, poblano peppers, if you want them hotter, you need to pick them while they're still green. Poblano peppers will turn into a color of red, reddish orange. They will lose a lot of their heat when they turn that color. That's truly from experience. The same thing goes for jalapenos. As jalapenos kind of start to really mature, if you've got enough calcium in your soil and magnesium in your soil, you won't, it'll fight off some of the diseases that it has and you won't get blossom end rot. Um, and if you can mature jalapenos, I personally love the flavor of red jalapenos. They're fantastic. Um, two things to try. I would tell in people to encourage them, New Mexico chilies. Uh, I, will, I, I always knew about New Mexico chilies. And then of course, uh, Dr. Clem uh, was talking about them one day since he had spent time in that part of the country. Um, it's a great thing to grow. I love growing it so I can make the Christmas sauce, which is, it's the same plant, but if when the plant, when the chili matures, it turns red and it gives you the red sauce. Or if you harvest the the pepper or the chili early, it's green and you get green sauce, thus combining the two, or you get some of each, you get Christmas sauce. And Thai chilies do exceedingly well here in the summer. Um, let's keep going. Hot weather spinach. Um, the, the only spinach I've been truly, really successful at is the Malabar spinach. It's an annual vine. You have to have a trellis to grow it. I've tried growing the New Zealand and the Okinawa spinaches. Um, I wouldn't say that I was abundantly successful at it. I did, I obviously I got crops, I got to, I harvested them. I ate the, the, the green leafies. They go really good in, in certain um, soups. They uh, stir fries, that type of stuff. It's really good. Or you can, uh, well, I like Italian food. So using spinach, is, you know, I'm putting it into my uh, eggplant rollatinis or that kind of thing. Can you tell that I, I, I really grow plants for the food of it? Um, Asian greens, another thing um, here. Uh, I got it there. That looks familiar. Yeah, that is my thumb in that picture. Um, that's tatsoi. It does great here. It's a little bitter, but it is uh, phenomenal for stir fry. Um, I, I absolutely love this and I grow this every summer. Mustard greens, uh, Asian mustard greens, those are hard, those seeds are harder to find. Uh, the tat soy, you can find the seeds for tat soy. They do, they do well here in the summer. Um, and it is a great substitute for spinach. It's got a, it's got a good flavor to it. Amaranth. Um, it's an interesting plant. I I grew this three years ago. I no longer grow this. I really don't like the flavor of it, me personally, but that should not dissuade you from growing this. It is interesting. The thing you have to worry about with this is it um, it's very susceptible to fungus and there's a certain type of caterpillar that absolutely loves munching this. And if you start to see little holes in the leaves of your amaranth, you've had you've got those caterpillars and they're, they, they spread rapidly, okay? Um, you can, and you, the other thing you have to harvest this while it's young and small, um, because then it's tender. Eggplant. Uh, this is a, an absolute staple for me. Um, everything on the screen, you see the pictures are of stuff that I have grown. Um, my personal favorite is to grow black beauties. Um, they 
they also, you, you got to magnesium and calcium again. And people are going to ask, well, I can already anticipate some of the questions at the end. You can go out to any one of the big box stores or the seed stores and look for tomato fertilizers. And I would encourage you not to use salt-based tomato fertilizer. I would look for organic fertilizer and side dress your plants um, with, with, with eggplants every two weeks. Every two weeks, you just take some of that fertilizer and sprinkle it around the base of your plant and water it in. Um, now, the reason I say tomato fertilizer, why to look for tomato fertilizer is because tomato fertilizers are typically have a very high magnesium and calcium content to feed into your soil. Okra goes gangbusters here. I love okra. I, I just, I, I pickle my okra. My okra is about to, I've already started the seeds for my okra plants, but you don't have to. They, that goes pretty quickly. So you can plant that even up to the beginning of June and still get a crop out of, out of okra. Um, it's a great plant here. It absolutely loves the sun. It does not need um, real a great depth of soil either. Uh, you can grow it in six inches of soil. You can grow okra in the con containers. Um, and if you got um, a blazing full sun and good moisture in your soil, you're gonna get a crop out of okra. It's very easy to grow. Okay, sweet potatoes. Sweet potatoes, if you think about it right now, where, when do we eat sweet potatoes? Well, I kind of eat them year round because I really like them but they're most well known for Thanksgiving. Planning, 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 planning. I can't stress it enough. It takes 150 days. As I mentioned earlier, there was a crop coming in this presentation that takes 150 days to maturity. This is it, okay? Well, fortunately, there's about 180 days. I think it's 189 days till Thanksgiving. So you have plenty of time to get to to sweet potatoes, excuse me, into the soil here come the end of May. Um, and that will give you a bumper crop to make that awesome sweet potato casserole that you want to have on your Thanksgiving table. There's nothing, and it's really easy. You can, you can grow these in, in containers. Get yourself a, a seven or a 10 gallon pot. It can be one of those plastic pots or a fabric pot and get yourself good soil and put your slips in and you will have a crop. Um, I promise you, I, I grew them the last two years out of these 15 gallon plastic pots that I have that came, that trees came in. Um, I, I'm just recycling. I, I load it up with soil, I put my slips in and I get a ton of sweet potatoes out of those two pots every single summer. Ah. This is an interesting crop. I grew it for the first time last year. Um, I used to try to grow chayote um, and I eliminated that from my world because it's difficult to grow. I don't really like to eat it. <laughs> and I know Colin Burroughs who's on here with us is shaking his head. Yeah, I don't like that either. <laughs> um, so I, have, I, I, I was searching for a crop to kind of figure out what something I like to, to grow and would grow here pigeon peas. They were right on the edge. There's, there's some caveats growing here. They do great in the summer here. You will have a bumper crop. Plant them on the south side of your house or with a southern exposure because this, this crop is found throughout the Caribbean. It's a staple food in the Caribbean. Um, if you eat, be if you ever been to the Caribbean, if you've been out to dinner in the Caribbean in the, at a restaurant and you've had a side dish of beans and rice, you were eating pigeon peas. I guarantee it. They have a very interesting flavor um, and they grow really well. The caveat is this, we are right on the edge. Uh, the USDA zone for pigeon peas is 9A, is the furthest north. Well, we're kind of like, uh, depends on where you are. If you're in the northern part of the county, we're really, you're kind of in almost in 8A, very close, 8B. But if you're in the southern part of the county, you're really close to that 9A zone. So it just, it depends on the, the year. Well, I learned this this winter. Um, if you want to carry these plants over, you have to cover them when, it, when it's going to frost. 
if you cover them when they, they're frost, they, they'll make it through, or you can put them inside of, you cut them back, put them inside of a tunnel, and they'll make it through the winter. If you don't cover them, and I, here, I had six plants last year. I have three plants this year that are already started, and I planted some more, um, because I really, this is really, to me, a delightful thing to bring to maturity and eat. Um, and it's prolific. It, you will have a ton of, you know, pigeon, pigeon peas, are, they remind me a little bit of a black eyed peas, but with a better flavor. Um, and they're fun to grow. They're very pretty plants too. Um, you can actually kind of grow them as a hedge. You're just going to have to make sure that on nights that it's going to freeze in the wintertime here, you got to have them covered. Yard long beans. Um, these are fun to grow. I, I, I'm, I haven't grown these for a couple of years, but uh, when my kids were younger, if you have young kids or you have grandchildren that are coming over, it's amazing how fast they grow. They'll be six inches one day, they'll be 12 inches the next day. Uh, and before you know it, they will, they literally, they'll be two or two and a half, three feet long. Um, they, and they do very well here. Um, <clears throat> they're fun to grow. They're, you gotta cut the, you got to cut the beans out of the pods. Obviously, the pods become very fibrous, but it you know the pods are really kind of designed to protect the bean from the sun. Uh, so you can't eat the pods, but they're they're fun to grow, uh, and they grow bananas. They grow crazy good here in the summertime. Wing beans. Um, I grow this. I grow this every summer. Um, th there's there's a couple caveats to growing this. Um, I grow them from seed. I get my seeds online. They're very, they're not the easiest seeds to find in stores here locally. Okay. They're fun to grow. They have a very unique mouthfeel. They have a very unique flavor. The caveat is you have, if they get longer than three inches, you don't want to eat them because they, it gets, they get chewy and tough and almost to the point where it's like you're chewing on, um, Think about chewing on a piece of ginger that doesn't have the ginger flavor, but you know how fibrous ginger root gets. It's, it gets like that. So you have to, you know, I, I harvest mine when they're two inches, two and a half inches, cut them in half, put them in a stir fry. They're fantastic. And they grow, they grow crazy. You got to trellis them. So you got to grow them up on a trellis. Um, but they are fantastic. I, I personally really like them. And if you try them, you you will probably like them too. Okay, other beans that grow well here in the summer are you know um, lima beans, black eyed peas, um, cream peas, adzuki beans, soybeans, which are pictured here at Amamaya. I grew that one year just to, for the experience of growing it. Um, it's a good nitrogen fixers. All these things are nitrogen fixers. So you'll notice that wherever you're planting them, you can plant these type of, of plants or crops into your cover crops if you want, which is not is actually a really good idea. And I do plant black eyed peas in my cover crops. It's one of my cover crops because I'll harvest that and eat it then. Okay. Some of the more, uh, I, I wouldn't call them vegetables, but other things that do very well here, obviously roselle. A lot of people grow roselle here. Um, I've had some of the best roselle tea that I've ever had at uh, the plant, the, the monthly meetings that the, the master gardeners have are always fantastic in the fall because we get roselle. <laughs> and, and I won't profess to growing it uh, very well. I don't, I've tried. I don't know what it is, I, and it's probably because I'm more focused on other things that I just don't pay attention to the plant, but it keeps coming back, so I'm doing something right. Um, but a fun plant, it's a pretty plant, pretty flowers, and the calyxes make really good tea. Cassava or yucca. Now, I, um, there's a lot of caveats that come with this particular plant. They, they can get very big. Um, they grow from tubers. You, you're, that's what you're going to eat though. You're going to eat the roots. They get to be very big plants. And if you ever drive by my house, you'll see a big yucca plant out in the front of my house. Um, you harvest the roots and you can 
cut them into French fries, literally, you can fry them like French fries, and they're actually pretty good, but they take a long time to cook. Now, I use yuca or cassava for something totally different. I dry mine out like I do to turmeric, and I grind it, and it is a uh, water or it is a water surficant. It's a it's a surficant. It breaks the ionic bonds of of water, um, and it's a very it does a really good job of doing that, to be honest with you. But if you like yucca fries, well, this is a plant that does very well here in the summertime. But the ca another caveat is, once you plant this, um, you can see by the the, the root uh, in the picture on the bottom. Um, you, once you plant this and it starts to go, getting rid of it is rather difficult. I'll put it that way. So pick and choose your, you know, right plant, right place. If you're going to plant this plant, plant it in the right place. So it needs some space. It can get 10, 12 feet tall. Mine is currently eight feet tall. Um, and you can, the, the root ball is really quite large. All right. Yikama. Um, <clears throat> I put it in here. I don't grow this anymore in the summertime um, because I personally just don't like to eat it. I don't like the flavor of it, but it grows really well. You can't eat the beans, um, but you eat the roots, which is what's pictured here. You pull out the root and it, it's, it's kind of like a giant radish, but it, I just don't personally like the, fa the, the flavor of it, uh, but it grows really well here. Um, the vines can get very tall um, or very long. I didn't, you could trellis this. I didn't trellis mine and it, you know, I have eight foot beds and it flew out of the beds. I mean, it was growing along the ground for quite a while. Um, and it takes the days to maturity on this. I didn't put this on here, but days to maturity are, are, are pretty long. I mean, you're 120 days to maturity on this crop. Seminole pumpkins, <clears throat> fun to grow. Kids love to grow them. They, they do, do very well. I've had Seminole pumpkin pie. It is pretty darn good, actually. Um, there is a lady in town that makes um, Seminole pumpkin pie every fall. And she makes little one, like, it's like three bites. She makes little, little tiny ones even. And I've... I, uh, I can't think of her name right now. It's, it's, it's eluding me, but I would, I would, I would, uh, I would give her a shout out as that's the word I'm looking for. I'd give her a shout out for her little business. She's over on the East side. And, um, this is a fun crop to grow. Kids like growing it needs a lot of water, but it, it does really well. It soaks up the sun and it's great for, uh, soil control, erosion control. Also herbs. We can't forget about herbs. Um, especially if you're a foodie like me, your summertime herbs, oregano, rosemary, thyme, the mints, all of those things, Mexican tarragon, um, it's the closest thing to French tarragon and it actually can survive. If you grow French tarragon, I grow French tarragon, you have to bring it indoors in the summer. It can't stand any heat. It'll die on you. Mexican tarragon, very close to the flavor of French tarragon. Uh, and does bonkers great here in the summertime. Um, all of those on the top line there will do very well here in the summertime. Basil, you can grow basil in the summertime, but you're going to constantly have to pinch it, pinch it, pinch it, because it it'll bolt on you, it'll flower and go to seed. So you got to constantly be pinching. As soon as you see flower head form, start to form, pinch the plant back, and it'll just continue to go so you can get it to go. Now, another uh, down on the bottom, obviously gingers do very well. A lot of people know gingers. So if you, you have, now there's a lot of different types of ginger. So if you want to have ginger for eating, meaning the, the, the typical Asian ginger, Asian spice ginger, you have to get that particular cultivar. So know that. Colantro. Colantro grows great here in the summertime and it tastes identical to coriander or um, that's what I call it, um, typically found in, in Mexican dishes. Uh, I can't think of the name of the, the darn thing. Um, and then turmeric. I never grew turmeric until about four years ago when one of our, the, my fellow master gardeners uh, brought turmeric in and she was growing it uh, on her farm in Micanopy. 
And I grow it every year now because of her. Um, I've propagated, I started only growing one, three or four years ago. And now I probably have 30 or 40 plants um, that I, I harvest every, every thanks, right, af right after uh, Thanksgiving time, roughly, is when, when you harvest that, that crop. I dry it, grind it, and I consume it. Uh, um, Every single day I, I consume it. I encapsulate it in the little tiny capsules. Um, and I take two grams of it every day, plus I use it in food. So these are things that'll do very, very well in, in North Florida when it comes to growing herbs and who can't use fresh herbs in their food? Come on, guys. Okay, another thing we can't forget are, I call, I call pollen, there's two things I call the best employees I have because they don't cost me anything um, and they never stop working. Pollinators are, are one of those employees. Worms are the other employee. Putting out pollinator plants, flowering plants, stuff to keep the bees and uh, the bees are not the only pollinators. Butterflies are also pollinators, but we have such a wonderful, great variety of bees here in Florida, not just the honeybee. Um, obviously that's a, a main uh, pollinator, but you need to plant things to keep them going throughout the, the summertime. And there's a lot of things that you can plant that will carry you through the summertime here. Okay, let's review real quick because we're almost done. And then we'll get to the Q&A. When do you want to water? You want to water early in the morning before that sun gets too high in the sky and try not do your level best. Not, don't get your leaves wet because once that, if the leaves are still wet, when the sun gets up, it'll burn your plants. You got to weed often because weeds grow great here in the summertime. So you got to keep on top of that and keep mulch down on the surface of your soil for weed prevention. Um, pests go, go crazy here in the summertime. Um, I like to use botanical sprays. Um, there's a, variety, a large variety of, of things that you can get, soap sprays, um, oil sprays, etc. But you don't want, again, you don't want to be spraying those things in the heat of the day. Um, if you can find disease resistant varieties, now that will be denoted those little plastic things that are found in transplants. They'll tell you on there, oh, it's disease, resist this disease or that disease or this fungus. Use, as I mentioned earlier, generous spacing to increase the airflow in your garden. Okay, fertilize regularly. A lot of these crops are very calcium and magnesium dependent. And I like to, you know, the, the best way to get pollinators into your garden is to grow pollinator crops, things that pollinators love next to or close to your garden. Um, by doing that, you're inviting those creatures and that they'll, they'll keep your, you'll have lots, you'll have plenty of eggplants to harvest if, and peppers to harvest if you do that. Okay, yeah, can't always scout for insects. It's very important because insects will get out of hand if you don't uh, kind of mind the shop there. You got to keep your eyes out for diseases. Now, um, I you, there's two ways to kind of combat diseases in the summertime. Fungus obviously grows. You can use an antifungal. Um, I, I have done that in the past and I have... Uh, I've had a few experiences where just stuff got away from me. What I decide, what I do is when I see a plant is diseased or has got a problem, I eliminate the plant. I don't compost it. I, it it's gone. I just, I, I take it out of the soil. I chop it. I leave the roots. I always leave my roots because my worms are going to eat those. Um, but I eliminate the plant from, from, the uh, from the garden space and then closely monitor the plants that are right around that for signs that they might have it too. Uh, I would encourage that when you start harvesting your summer crops, if you can harvest the bulk, the bulk of the crop in a short window of time is better. Chop your crop, leave the roots as I just mentioned, okay? And if you're doing container gardening, I know a lot of people like to container garden in the summertime. Um, or it, during the growing seasons, don't forget them in the summertime because weeds will take hold in your in in inside of your containers, and that can cause you just headaches down the road. Eliminate the headache. So that's kind of it in a nutshell. Let's get to the Q and A, if we can. Christy, you you still there?
I think you're running the Q and A. If my if I'm it's a team effort here. Everybody's okay, good. been helping. <laughs> All right. Well, we've got a few in, uh, questions that were taken care of for you during the presentation, but there are a few left and a few more coming in now. So I'll just start at the top and we'll we'll go from there. Um, Judy Funk did ask a question and I'm not into, she may have to elaborate a little more. She asked, okay to grow over septic, but she didn't identify what plant she was referring to. So in general, do you typically try to avoid that area or is it okay to grow items over a septic area? Depends on what you're growing, I guess. Grass would probably do great over septic. <laughs> 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 um, you know, I'm, I'm just thinking about if we're talking about a turkey mound septic system, which is common here in North Florida, I, I would be hesitant to grow plants on top of that. Um, I, I think grass is probably the best crop for that. Um, or, you know, here, it'd be beautiful to plant a a huge pollinator garden on top of that. I think that you, that you do very well with that. It would look very pretty too. Um, if you have a leach field, well, yeah, you could grow a garden at the end of your leach field. You're going to be getting a lot of pretty good nitrogen and, and I think you'll get some decent mineral, the, the minerals that you're going to want to see that are most commonly used by plants are going to be at the, still there at the end of a leach field but that's probably the the closest and the reason i'm saying that is you know really what we're talking about is manure okay well i don't care if it's hue manure or not um it's it's just you want if you're putting manure into your garden putting fresh manure in is a mistake you want well rotted composted manure so if you're planting food crops, I would say not on a, not on a turkey hill, um, but certainly at the end of a leach field not, would be appropriate. Makes sense. Makes sense. Wonderful. Okay, what about bitter melon? Does that grow well in summer? Oh, you know, it's something I didn't put in here. Um, melons do, do do very well. I, the reason, okay, watermelons grow really well here. Most melons grow really well here in the summertime. I have a strange food allergy and I don't know what it is, but I cannot eat watermelon. So that's why I didn't put it into this um, presentation. So yes, your melons, melons typically do very well here in the summertime. Excellent. Okay, it looks like I can probably get two questions in one here of a sort. Uh, what are some pollinator plants that you like for summertime? And are there any that can be planted now? Um, certainly. You can plant um, God, a, a huge variety. Your, any of your wildflowers. So call, if you plant some of these now, uh, you're, for, for this season, you're going to want to plant annual pollinating plants. So your milkweeds and your coneflowers and your black-eyed Susans and uh, galardias and, and those type of plants are, are perennials. And you're not going to get flowers this year, but you'll get them next year if you're going to plant seeds now. Um, or if you want to have them for next year, really the ideal time to plant those is in the fall, and then you'll get a flower crop next next summer. Um, one of the a, a really great pollinator plant is um, Mexican sunflowers. They're very pretty. They grow very tall. They're very popular. Bees and butterflies absolutely Adorable. positively love them. <laughs> um, another thing that does very well here in the summertime, they bloom in the spring, but it does great, is um, aloe. Aloe is good. Pollinators flock to aloe. You'll get hummingbirds to aloe. Um, and if you want to extend their flowering season, well, you just got to you got to feed them a phosphorus fertilizer and that's going to get the plant to generate more flowers out of it. But aloe does great too. Great, great in the summertime here. Um, you can find aloe. Hey, you can come to my house and harvest it out of my front yard. I have like 10,000 aloe plants. Um, Obviously do well then. <laughs> they, they do very well in the, in the sandy soil we have here in Florida. Very and true. They are sunbathers. They love the sun. Right. Excellent. Okay. Uh, let's see. Uh, 
question there, is there a good source of straw, not hay, locally that you're aware of? Um, that's, you know, here, let's first point out because the, the, whoever asked that question is very knowledgeable. There is a huge difference between hay and straw, and a lot of people don't know what the difference is. Straw is just the shaft typically of wheat, but sometimes of a variety of, of crops that are grown. Uh, it has no seed. Hay is grass and it has seed in it. And you don't ever want to put down hay ever. So, hey, don't put that down. <laughs> That's the clue because you're going to grow grass in your garden. So straw. Good um, job. You, 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 I would tell people you got to ask because there's, if you go to the big box stores, sometimes they'll have straw and I'm thinking of a particular big box store. Um, a lot of the big box stores though, they have straw that is coated so that it has a shelf life, which uh, uh, I, I, I don't want a chemical coating on my straw because right. I want it to, to deteriorate and turn into my next you know top layer of soil. Right. The only place that I have, gotten it locally is Alachua feed and seed and he doesn't always have it. All right, thank you. Uh, let's see here. I also, this is Colin. I also found it at Tractor Supply yeah, up, yeah. up on 53rd of 441. Yeah. Small just, bales just, of, um, of, of straw. You, you, you hit the nail on the head. You got to get a bale up there because they, they have on their shelves stuff that's treated. So just know the difference yeah absolutely and and i used it in the uh, potato towers to to line the oh potatoes. perfect perfect application colin yeah all right thanks yeah um do you know that you can eat the cassava leaves too they're edible um yes i just don't like the flavor <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I guess, I'm crazy. being honest. I, you know, yeah. I and, and honestly, I don't. I don't really know. It's a. It's such a project to to harvest the roots. I harvest all, as a water surfacant. It the the powder goes so far. I mean, literally, a teaspoon of uh, yucca root powder will treat a couple hundred gallons of water uh, as a surfacant. So. But they do make great fries. And yes, you can eat the leaves. I'm just not a fan. Sorry. <laughs> OK. Wonderful. Bear with me. I'm filtering through comments amongst the questions here. So uh, let's see. Someone is asking, where can I find pigeon peas seeds? Um, you you easily find them online. Um, I would call around before I wouldn't drive around looking for them locally. I bought mine online um, and they came to me from a, a, a fella actually on eBay from Texas. And um, that's a, that I, that's a fun crop. Just grow it on, grow it on the South side of your house. I've grown it in two places on my house. Cause I didn't know where, where it was going to do well. Um, and I, so I grew it on the west side of my house and I grew it on the south side of my house and the south side massively outproduced the west side. So almost two to one. All right. Uh, let's see, Lorraine Benton asked, uh, and forgive me if I'm not sure where in the presentation you might have referenced, what about ladybugs? Should we buy and let them go? Um, you, you can, um, there's, I, I would tell you, um, ladybugs are good employees, except they, 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 they don't contract well, meaning they don't stick around. Okay. Ladybugs will fly away very rapidly. What I would tell you, um, I wouldn't discourage you from getting ladybugs, green lace wing, green lace wing. If you're going to control insects with predatory insects, that's, that's my first choice. And the reason for it is that the green lace wing itself um, is not, uh, is not a huge predator, but the, the larva is, they look like little tiny alligators, believe it or not, kind of, sort of. Um, they are voracious eaters, just 
like if you have aphids somewhere and you, I mean, they will literally eat thousands of aphids a day. Um, and they stick around. That's the nice thing about green, green lace wings. You can buy the, um, the larva and have them shipped to you. Um, release them into your into your garden and within 30 days you'll see the mature green lace wings laying eggs no that's look that up on google so you know what they look like they're really kind of cool looking eggs but a lot of people think oh that's some kind of weird stuff i got to get rid of that you know you just need mm -hmm. to know what the green lace wing eggs look like they look like little tiny little white water droplets on a long string hanging off the leaves of your plant on the underside yes so look, Google green lace wing eggs and you'll see pictures of it. So know what they look, that looks like. But that, that is a great predator. And of course, a praying mantis is a good predator, but they don't stick around either. Right. So, but here, there's, there's three. I would not certainly, I would absolutely not discourage you from employing ladybugs. Agreed. Okay, this one is kind of a... a it's an interesting question. Back to soil, uh, fertilize, using fertilizer and soil, how much or not how much. Uh, person said, for the first time I used black cow in my beds and my seeds sprouted after a long time and the plants never grew more than a couple inches. I also used peat moss in the beds. Could this have contributed, I'm assuming, to their lack of vigorous growth? Uh, the peat moss, I guess, is the question. I mean, I, I'm an advocate of peat moss. Um, I, I don't have anything bad to say about peat moss. In the summertime, in this, you have to, in the, if you're going to use peat moss, here, there's a couple of caveats, okay? There, there's a couple of drawbacks. It decomposes very rapidly because it's very hot here. Um, and it, it, if it dries out, it's got great water holding capacity, okay? Mm -hmm. But if it dries out, you have to. And I mean, you have to use a surficant to re-wet it. If it dries right. out, it will not hold water. It, will, it repels water. So because of that, I don't, I'm not a big fan of, of, of that here in Florida. Okay. I use coca core. coca core doesn't dry out. You don't need a surficant. It lasts right. much longer in your soil. Um, but they're, I won't say here, I'm not going to tell you, oh, absolutely don't use peat moss. Use peat moss. It's a great amendment to your soil. Now, why your plants didn't grow? Um, black, just know when you're, when you're, black cow is uh, composted manure, dairy manure or uh, beef cattle manure. So it is very high in nitrogen. What you need to do with that is you need to add a lot of amendments to it. Okay, so it's, it's lacking in a lot of minerals. Um, other than what is grown, you know, been composted through that grass that's gone through the bovine process. Um, I would tell, and you have to amend it. So you're going to want to amend it, uh, amend it with vermiculite and perlite and, and peat moss or coco core. Um, and, and then I would add a, an all purpose garden fertilizer to it. But the other, and here's the other thing too, is you don't, if you're just building soil, and this is kind of a whole nother presentation, if you're building soil, you got to give your soil time to mature. And I, when I build soil, because I build soil from scratch, I compost, I'm composting 12 months out of the year, and I compost hundreds of gallons of compost a year. Um, once I get my soil made, okay, so it's all mixed and made, I let it sit for a minimum, minimum of 90 days before I put a seed or a plant into it, because it just, it needs to cook. You know, it just, it needs to settle down. So that might've been one of the reasons why you, the plant was just like, yeah, move, it's too hot in this soil. You know, right. there's too much nitrogen yet. That, that's a, I don't know, I don't know that, but that's a distinct possibility. Well, okay. there was a question earlier about a local source of coca -Cola. Um, I don't get mine locally. Um, I, I would tell you that when it comes to, you got to do your research when it comes to coca core. There's a, there's really two, 
different types of coca cord uh, because of where it comes from and the primary growing regions of cocoa on the planet are uh, overseas and very um, coastal. Um, you, there is washed coca core and then there's unwashed coca core. So unwashed coca core has a very high salt content because mm -hmm. um, it's traveling generally on ships to get here and it's it's harvested um, in the Philippines, in Sri Lanka and India. Those are your main growing regions for coke, uh, cocoa, uh, coconuts. Uh, and for those of you that don't know what coca core is, it is the hull or the shell of coconuts. That's what it is. Um, if you get the, it, there's always a big price difference. People will ask me, why is this bag of coca core $30 and this block of coca core $5? But it's the same cubic feet. Well, it's because one is washed and taken care of and you can just put it into your soil and amend it. And the other, you have to know how to wash it. You have to, and you really got to, I mean, literally put it in a pool. I get, I, that's where I start on a lot of my stuff because it's so cheap, but you have to wash it. So I'll put several blocks into a kiddie pool and I will fill that kiddie pool and drain that kiddie pool several times to get the salt out of it. Okay, now local source. Uh, Alachua Feed and Seed has it in bags from a very good uh, purveyor or, or manufacturer of cocoa core. Um, it's not, it's not cheap though. Just know that it's, it's not cheap. That's all you can get it on. Uh, you can get it online in blocks and just know that you're going to have to watch it. And, and that process of washing takes about 30 days, you know, fill that pool up once a week, drain it once a week, fill it up, drain it, fill it up, drain it. All right, then. Well, hey, related to mulch in general, um, does Alachua County have a free mulch source and is it worth using? I personally, I, I'm, I'm I've hoping heard... somebody else can answer that. I, oh. <laughs> I honestly don't know. <laughs> no, I'm just, I, I, re I really don't. That's okay. Um, you know, if you talk, yeah, the answer to that question is, um, Yes, actually, I could give you somebody's name at GRU who is responsible for um, distributing mulch from all the trees that they cut down to mm -hmm. maintain their power lines. But there's a huge caveat with that is you're you don't know really what you're getting. Okay, you're getting lots of different stuff when. Uh, I'm assuming it probably hasn't been processed either. It, it hasn't been. I've gotten it and I've uh, mulched uh, everything around my house except my vegetable gardens. Yeah, I agree. It's not good for vegetables. It's just it's, not good. It, for, it takes yeah. ages to break down. Yes. that and Which is great if you want to mulch the front of your house and make it look nice. Hey, it's free and they'll come. You got, you're going to be on a waiting list, but mm -hmm. they'll all of a sudden a big truck will show up at your house and dump three or four yards of it on your driveway, wow. I mean, you know, so, and they're happy to do it. Um, but it takes forever to break down and um, you, you get more than you're getting the leaves. You're getting everything that they, 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 I mean, right. they're mulching whole tree branches. So. Duly noted. Okay. Uh, let's see. What's the best way to deal with fire ants in a summer garden? Gasoline? <laughs> um, no, you know, um, that, that there's one of the reasons why I do raised bed gardening. Um, and here, you know, here, I, I should have taken a picture of my garden. What the way the what I do is I have my raised beds and I have cardboard. I have big, huge, long sheets of cardboard that I lay around and in between all of my beds and I weigh that down with, now that decomposes pretty quickly, obviously, especially in the summer, but I weigh it down with pavers that my kids have made for me, um, uh, you know, out of, you know, little projects when they were younger with little marbles and all that kind of stuff in them. Um, that's one way of prevention. Now I have, I, I you know, you can chemically treat them, but when you do that, what do they do? They just move. There are repellents out there. Um, 
there there's one particular repellent that I know works very well. It's a sulfur based repellent, but boy, does it smell bad. I mean, whoo, bad. So I, you know, that, that would be my, my answer. Fire ants are a pain in the tail. Fair enough. And agreed. <laughs> yeah. You know, All right. I, unfortunately here, fire ants, have they taken up residence underneath my cardboard? And how have I figured that out? Well, because all of a sudden my foot is on fire. <laughs> <laughs> it, that, that would get my attention as well. Yes. Um, okay, let's see. Uh, I'm, I'm trying to wrap these up, but group them at the same time. We have two more mulch questions. Can you use a mix of live oak leaves and pine needles as a mulch? Sure. And does the color of the mulch make a difference? Um, I I am kind of a, I can already hear Taylor laughing, even though he's muted. He's, <laughs> and he's, and he said out loud, um, uh, anally retentive is probably what he said when it comes to um, this subject. Yeah. Um, I'm, I, 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 why do you want to put something that's dyed a specific color into your soil? I don't know. Why do you want those chemicals in your soil? I, I don't know. I, I wouldn't do that. Um, there's two mulches that I really like a lot. Um, straw, straw, wheat straw in specific, um, because, or, or alfalfa straw. If you can find alfalfa straw, it's got a really good uh, carbon and nitrogen ratio, uh, which it's 17 to one, it breaks down very quickly. Um, Actually, I think it's a little higher than that, or lower than that. I think it's like 10 to 1 for alfalfa. Wheat is a little 17 to 1. Um, I also like, now it takes a long time to break down, but I like saw, hardwood sawdust. Now, there's nothing wrong with using live oak leaves and pine straw. There's a caveat to that over the course of time, and it's going to be a long time, but over the course of time, you're going to acidify your soil with those things. Okay. So just okay. know that goes kind of back to what I said earlier in the presentation. A mm -hmm. soil test is is can be really important. And very valuable yeah. in many ways. <laughs> and it's very easy to pH test your soil too. You just buy one of those meters, stick it in the soil, it tells you. Agreed. Agreed. It might not be perfect, but if it's really acidic and all of a sudden you're looking at it and it's like 5.5 and you're wondering why nothing grows, well, that's why. Um, and it has nothing to do with, you might have a ton of minerals in your soil, but the, 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 the ability for your plants to take up those minerals is almost next, to, it's very bad, it's very limited because of the soil pH. So right. the soil is hanging on to those minerals. Won't let them go. That makes sense. Um, okay, uh, Judy had another question, but I'm just gonna read it and you can help me decipher it. How do you cut a cover crop before it finishes flower if it is interplanted, as you suggested, with a harvestable crop that needs to finish fruiting? Ah, great, great question. Okay. Um, the, how I do that, so picture, picture if you will. <laughs> Christy got that reference, I see the smile. <laughs> Think of a, a, a raised bed garden that is um, four, f three feet by eight feet. That, those are basically my beds. They're, they're actually 33 inches wide, but so picture that rectangle. Um, I will typically plant something and it has to, everything to do with planning. So let's be specific. If I want to grow black eyed peas, and I know that they're 90 days to maturity. I know that millet is 120 days to flower. So I'll use those two. And I'll know that buckwheat is 110 days to flower. So I'm not getting the seeds on those for a while after I have the ability to harvest my black eyed peas. Okay, that's brilliant. That, that's <laughs> That's the answer, but you have to plan, you have to do research and you have to know the, the that's why I put it in this presentation, know your time to maturity. It's not just about the vegetables. If you're going to do cover crops and I mean, that is my main crop in summer. 
that and people laugh sense. at me all the time because I have these big eggplant plants growing and then I have millet and 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 garbanzo beans which don't do really well in the summer but uh, and buckwheat and sesame and all those things now sesame oof, don't let that go to seed you'll never get rid of it if <laughs> Even if you like using it in your cuisine, if you they are so they're they're so prolific seeding. Do um, I noted? I would I would grow that separately if that's what you if you want to harvest this you want to grow that that crop for its seed. Mm -hmm. Um, grow it separately. Fair it's enough. a fun crop to grow, and it's uh, well you you'll have bags of the stuff. Understood. Ooh, here's a fun one. How much attention do you pay to insects or pests with a cover crop? Uh, you know, you're obviously checking for uh, your fruiting plants, uh, you know, your whatever your edibles are going to be. But what about for the cover crops? Do you bother with them at all or do you need to keep them in check? Um, I do two things really to there's well, no, I do three things to battle insects I don't want to see. Um, number one, I'm, I'm planting plants that insects don't like, um, yarrow, marigolds, uh, angelica, that those are great. You know, angelica is more of a trap plant. Um, but this is, this is a whole nother, I could do a whole nother presentation on this, this topics. Um, so, you know, I want, I want repellent plants that you can put that in the mix here um uh green lace wings I, I mean i every summer i mean i i should have a picture in this presentation of of i can walk into my garden in the summertime and stand there and if i if you take um honey You'll get bees to come and land on you and you'll get green lace rings to come and land on you. And I've had a handful of them come and land on my hand just to, to, to eat, basically. Mm -hmm. um, it's really kind of, it, it's a cool photograph if I would take that. And, and I've done it just to see, because I've heard that it works and son of a gun, it does work. Um, they're, they're, they're great employees. Um, I, I can't, and I employ them in my cover crops and you'll see them fluttering. They look like little fairies they fluttering, around, <laughs> fluttering around, around in your garden. Um, but if it gets really bad, if I have something that just gets really bad, I use a, uh, a neem oil solution, a neem solution uh, in, in, and I spray it in, into whatever it is I'm spraying on. Like cucumbers is, is a crop right now that I'm, I'm, the fruit I am spraying with neem, a neem solution that, you know, just gets rid of those cutworms. So, you know, that's, that's my last step. Sure. All right. All right. That's good. I got some good tips there myself. Yeah. Um, I'm gonna... If it's really bad, I would say go get a commercial insecticide and then you're going to have mm. to wash your, your fruit. I'm not a big fan of that, but last resort. Yeah. yeah. That's, that's the nuclear option, I guess. <laughs> and we do try to avoid that on occasion. <laughs> All right, then I'm going to take a, one last question here before we call it for the day. And uh, hopefully I, uh, I ask this correctly. Uh, what material do you use for raised beds? I'm not sure if they're re referring to the building of it or the filling of it, though. I, I'm guessing it's the building, but well, here I'll, I'll do both. <laughs> um, I, and here it's it's a great question because I am I am trying something new this year, and by this time next year, I'll be able to tell you whether or not it's going to be successful. Um, I use I have two materials. Um, one is wood. I use pressure treated wood um, because obviously it lasts longer, but then I line the inside of the bed in a non BPA plastic sheeting. Okay. okay. So that it, that I create a chemical barrier there. I also have um, a fabric bed. It's um, you know, here grassroots fabric pots. Okay. You can Google that. 
Um, they make beds, they'll make them to, the, to size. They, they're more of a commercial manufacturer, but they're, and they're not cheap, but you can buy them. I have one um, mm -hmm. it, and it works great. I mean, it's, it, I've had it for five years now and it hasn't deteriorated and it's in the same place. It does great. Um, what I'm trying, what I'm new this year um, is I, I, and I've made my first section, but I have to let it cure. Um, I, is I have made perlite based cement panels. Okay. And the panels interlock uh, mine are 16 inches tall by by four feet long, and they're about three inches wide, maybe two and a half inches wide. And, mm -hmm. you know, I have a form, uh, I poured, I've just did it this spring, um, but to cure that, you have to cure that in water, I guess, to, so that it doesn't uh, leach anything into your soil. Uh, but once it's cured, it's supposed to be fantastic. I don't know how long it's gonna last. Um, and I made it like a typical concrete, except for no gravel. I used perlite so that it would be lighter for me to haul around if I have to haul it around. But I put, and I put chicken wire in it, so I think it'll hold. Um, and it turned out really great. I mean, they're they're nice looking. Um, I you know we'll we'll see. So I'm trying that because eventually, even though you're using um, treated lumber with you know. BPA free plastic sheeting on the inside, I've had, you know, they still break down over the course of time. You're still going to lose that. So I just, re you know, I know that I, I replaced one of my beds this year and I can see that I'm going to replace two more. So I'm going to try building cement beds. As far as what goes inside, well, like I said, I build my own soil. I start with compost, um, which includes the compost that I generate, includes earthworm castings, coca core, vermiculite perlite. Um, if you can get, if you can get um, uh, lava rock, crushed lava, that, that holds uh, biology really well. Um, you know, and I, and I just mix it all together and, 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 I, and I make a lot of that when I wanna build new beds. And away we go. Uh, Judy asked, what size did you say on your concrete form again? Okay, the form itself um, is, it is four feet long. It is 16 inches tall. And it's about, I, I would, I'm guessing it's two and a half inches. Like if it's two and a half inches wide if you're, if you're looking down on it. Now, I'm gonna take two, two four foot sections and the way that my form is built is so they interlock and they have a hole in the middle. So I'm going to drive a piece of uh, rebarb, rebar, steel rebar down to hold them in. Right. And then the end pieces are 30 inches wide. I have two, okay. you know, just a 30 inch piece. And that also is, um, it's made the and I got these plans online. I just made them bigger than the plans I got because I wanted sure. a 16 inch depth of soil. So, <clears throat> okay. That and I'm going to build a, a, an eight foot long by, by 30 inch wide beds is what I'm going to end up building out of one, two, three, four, four side pieces and two end pieces. Wow. Okay. Excellent. That sort of actually lasts for a long time, Scott. Uh, that's uh, really good. That that's what I'm hoping for because yeah. it's it's, I, it's uh, not cheap to do it. I'll, I'll just uh, that's uh, another. It's not cheap to build uh, here. I thought it was going to cost me a a couple of hundred bucks to build two beds. Well, yeah, wrong. <laughs> uh, I built right four, six raised beds uh, eight years ago from Cypress. And uh, you know what's happening now. Yeah, yeah. Uh, IFAS does say that you can use pressure treated lumber now. There used to be a, a, a myth that you couldn't use that. But since 2003, uh, I think it was that the uh, toxic store has been uh, removed. So, They've changed the chemical composition. Yeah, yeah, I, see, I didn't know that. Yeah, and here, I, I will tell you a real easy way to build a bed is go out and buy yourself 
a go to go one of the box stores, one of the box hardware stores by yourself. Now lumber prices are very expensive, but it's still really cost effective. A four foot by eight foot piece of three quarter inch treated plywood. Have them cut it into sixteen inch strips, and 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 cut you know thirty you know by doing that you're going to be sixteen. It's you get three strips out of because four feet divided by three is 16 inches. So you're going to get three strips and then you can cut down the side walls or the end walls for, you know, everybody says, well, you just cut it in half, four feet. Two feet is a long way to reach, okay, into your garden from each side, you believe it or not. That's why I make my beds 30 inches, very easy to tend those plants in the middle. Yeah, mine are the same, nice. the same width. That's, that's, that's uh, prudent, as I think. Uh, yeah, well, especially, I mean, uh, unfortunately, Colin, it's, uh, we, we both hate to admit it, but we're not spring chickens anymore. So our backs sure. don't like that. Don't like that. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Well, I well think gentlemen, we the thank end you. Of our time here. <laughs> yes. Thank you so much for answering all the questions, Scott. Um, do you have any final thoughts for us before we call it a day? Uh, good luck and good planting. Here, here. Absolutely. Here. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, folks, for the rest of you still here in the listening, if you would take a look in your chat box, we have a follow up survey with a link to it. Uh, it's maybe about five or six lines up from the bottom. Please give us your feedback on how we did today. And uh, I thank you very much. And we are going to call it a day. Thank you so much, Scott, and everyone else for helping out today. I appreciate it. Uh, au revoir. All right, then. I'm trying to see if Taylor is somewhere close by.